There are just eight months left until the UK hosts the UN Climate Conference. And despite Boris Johnson's insistence that we will have a green recovery from the pandemic, in the last month, there have been a number of climate-related controversies, including around the construction of a new coal mine in Cumbria, the Leeds-Bradford airport expansion, and plans to cut air passenger duty on domestic flights. What we need is a commitment at home from the UK. That means, you know, stopping um, oil and gas licensing for the future, not opening new coal mines, stopping handouts to the fossil fuel industry and in industrial agriculture. The UK's credibility as COP president rests on demonstrable climate action at home. And yet, much like the government's failed pandemic response, which has left 130,000 people dead, the government is acting too slowly, prioritising profit over public well-being. You know, words are good, symbolic actions are important, but what's better than both those things is a credible, costed plan and proper financial commitments. So, why can't the economic status quo deal with the climate emergency? What has the fresh attention on climate actually achieved? And what can the pandemic teach us about the climate crisis? We are pushing nature to its limit. We're pushing population to its limit. We're pushing communities to their limit. We're stressing the environment. We're stressing populations and communities. We are creating the conditions in which epidemics flourish. We're forcing and pushing people to migrate away from their homes because of climate stress. We're doing so much, and we're doing it in the name of globalization, in some sense of chasing that wonderful thing that people call economic growth. In my view, that's become an, a, a malignancy, not growth. Because what it's doing is driving unsustainable practices in terms of how we manage communities, how we manage development, how we manage prosperity. We're writing checks that we cannot cash as a civilization for the future. In this episode of the Weekly Economics podcast, we're asking how can we change the rules of our economy to stop environmental breakdown? I'm Aisha Thomas-Smith, recording this podcast from my house. Stay with us. This week, I am really pleased to be joined down the line by Laurie Laybourne Langton. Did I say that right? You did. Fantastic co-author of the new book, Planet on Fire and Neff Trustee. Hi, Laurie. Hi, pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for taking the time. So let's start off with the big central argument of your book. So you write that the climate crisis and ecological breakdown are primarily political crises, which is a kind of novel angle and a really interesting one. So what do you mean by that? What we were trying to do is to draw out some of the big things that we've seen that are missing from the mainstream framing of the environmental crisis. The first thing to say is that often, or at least until recently, it hasn't included the full picture of what is going on with the environment. For a number of years, we've had this big mainstream focus on climate change, an understanding of how serious that is, and it not just as changes but as a full-blown crisis, has increased enormously, at least in the last couple of years, right? But then we have got some progress being made in relation to appreciation of this as biodiversity loss, another one of the big things that's going on that you alluded to there in the introduction. But we're not yet seeing this as an overall problem of the destabilization of the overall picture of nature across the world, this kind of earth system, as it were, that provides us with the extraordinary conditions in which life and our societies can flourish, right? So one of the main political problems here is that our mainstream politics has been unable to really grasp the full scale of the problem that we face. You know, this is a critical destabilization of the life support systems that provide us with the foundation upon which anything, including and in particular economic activity, can even occur. Okay, that makes sense. Let's go a bit deeper on some of the central arguments of the book. Let's start off, if you could tell us a bit more about what kind of capitalism and imperialism, as you write about, have to do directly with the climate crisis. Where are the links? So, yeah, this is for us the sort of second big thing that's missing from that political story about where we are at the moment, right? So you get all of these people rolled out in the media all the time who are lamenting that we've not really made progress so far. You've got Bill Gates writing in his blog and and in his recent book that people just need to be educated more. They have to have a better understanding that it's got this bad. Or you've got um, President Emmanuel Macron at at a summit saying we need more bravery. And uh, and you've got others 
I read an op-ed from a psychologist the other day saying there's something about human beings that makes them selfish. And it's really seductive to hear this stuff and think, oh, that makes perfect sense. Maybe these are individually or together the reasons why we're not we're not making progress and we're not actually grasping this problem and dealing with it. The big problem there is that it's just missing a huge part of what has led us to this point. Fundamentally, this is about power. It's about the power of certain structures, dynamics that exist across the world that occur because of the ways our economies are built. And this is where things like imperialism come from. If you look back at the history of the last 400, 500 years, which is a history of slavery, it's the history of the emergence of formal empires like the British Empire, and then those empires disappearing, but the continuation of a very unequal global economy. That story there is inseparable from the story, the growing story of environmental crisis that is now reaching this astonishing cacophony that we face at the moment. And to put it bluntly, as those global economic structures spread around the world and brought us slavery, brought us colonialism, brought us all the exploitation that came with it, they also brought destruction of nature. They destroyed peoples and they exploited peoples and they destroyed and exploited nature. And we dip into a story in the book around Easter Island, which is often thrown up there as the perfect example of, of how problems innate in us can lead to disaster. And, you know, we, it's the story that Easter Island was this island that's right in the middle of nowhere, as it were, in the Pacific. And society collapsed there. It's a sort of mainstream story. And that's because people unthinkingly destroy the environment. They were caring for each other. But the sum effect of that over time was to rob them of crucial things like trees that enabled their society to flourish and the whole thing fell to pieces. But actually, that's not what happened. It turns out that as we've been able to get more information from archaeological digs and stuff, that the society there was actually doing all right. The thing that led it to collapse was the contact that the society there made with people from Western countries who brought with them disease. They captured people from the island and sold them into slavery, and they exploited and murdered people on that island. And it was that that led to that collapse. And then you have to ask yourself the question, well, why were these people out there sailing ships to find this island? And it was because they were compelled to do that by these big economic systems that were growing up around the world that demanded that they go seeking out cheap bodies and cheap nature that would then feed into big global systems of, of profit making. I think that's a really good example to illustrate a lot of what you've been talking about there. And I know that you kind of refer to it in the book as extractivism. And that's a, a word that I've heard others like Christine Berry use to talk about how we should be framing essentially the issues that we're facing now on climate and beyond. Could you explain a little bit exactly what extractivism is? Is it essentially what you were just saying? Is there more to it? And, and how might we be using that frame? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good way of trying to conceive of why this has happened, you know, why are people compelled to sail in under awful conditions halfway around the world, literally, to go and, you know, discover places and exploit places like Easter Island or to go to your backyard and, and cut down forests, that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, what you're trying to do in a system in which firms and other people have to invest to try and maximize their profits is that you're looking for places where basically you can cut corners or get things cheaper. And that is what is in large parts been compelling people to go to different parts of the world throughout this hundreds of year history and to find places where the things they need to make their products and provide their services like labor, you know, people working for them or natural resources like wood to cut down and make things with where they are far cheaper and i don't just mean in this terms of buying things it just is far easier for you to get hold of them than you would elsewhere and that to the extreme is things like slavery where you are capturing people you're not paying them at all and you're forcing them into undertaking labor for you and the wholesale destruction of the natural world without any kind of idea of what that could, destruction will mean over the long term for us. And as time's gone on, you know, we have been patting ourselves on the back in the media in this country, often talking about abolishing slavery. You know, we introduced certain rules and regulations, which are by no means sufficient. 
to deal with the exploitation on things like the labor side, we are still nowhere near effectively transferring the same principle to nature. So we are not extracting from it in a completely unsustainable way, which is where we are now. And that's coming back now to haunt us at the global level in a really serious way. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. And I think, um, you know, as we know, it's other systems like white supremacy and the systematic dehumanization of people of color and indigenous peoples that have facilitated that kind of extractivism over centuries. And of course, now when we're talking about um, what this all means for climate, and as you say, Britain likes to have this idea of itself as the country that abolished slavery, when in fact, we know it created it and then just exported it, actually, rather than... um, abolishing it, it kind of feels like the chickens are coming home to roost, as it were, and we're really being confronted with the reality of that legacy. So you mentioned the power a couple of times, and I think it's quite clear that a core angle of the book is that climate breakdown is just that, it's a problem of power. So in your opinion, then, who does have the power to do something about this? I know it's quite a crude question, but you also mentioned there's been a big shift over the past few years with more mainstream attention on the climate crisis. But does this include a better understanding of where that power lies and and what needs to be done? I think that's beginning to happen. I think fundamentally, some of the big ruptures of the last couple of years, the emergence of things like Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for the Future and the Rider Youth Strike Movement, you know, the list goes on, have fundamentally been about a backlash against this huge frustration that the narrative around the environmental crisis and what we should do about it has not been playing out in the way politically that we should probably expect for a problem that is so serious. Many of the elements of those campaign organisations had a pretty hefty critique of modern environmental organisations, for example, that they had basically been employing a pretty conservative strategy of, you know, we will try and influence people in power. Uh, in an incremental way, we will effectively, you know, try and push them to make small changes, and we're not necessarily going to rock the boat. And I think a lot of those movements are just this outpouring of frustration that this isn't about sort of winning concessions. It's about making the political weather, you know, you've got this massive environmental crisis that's literally making the weather and is pushing us towards the race to utter catastrophe. And how power is interacting with that, political power, corporate power, is obviously completely disproportionate to the scale of the challenge. And it's almost as if we've been doing this thing with a break on, you know, and that break being just not turning this into a massive sort of political social movement. And I think that that the big moments that have occurred over the last couple of years have been that moment where environmentalism has got its latest version of a a massive social political movement that then sprung up. And what that's doing is saying, okay, there are a few places that hold huge power in having created this mess and also are now, as a result of that, going to have to change their approach to how they use that power. Foremost among them are politicians who, through government, when they're in government, have extraordinary control, more than they dare admit and would allow themselves to use over the systems that drive environmental breakdown and also for companies as well, of course. And one of the big, again, issues I think that's been grabbed onto quite a lot by this sort of new wave of environmentalism over the last few years, which like anything is just sort of resuscitating arguments that have always been around there, is to question full on some of the deeper things that sit within our economic systems that are leading to this destruction. And that in particular is the consumption model at the heart of how our societies are supposed to operate. A lot of the mainstream argument, the way they are using their power in position of influence, people in governments and companies right now, is to say, well, we've got to basically swap dirty for clean. We take dirty power like coal and we'll swap it for clean like uh, wind turbines. And we've got dirty cars, so we'll electrify cars and they'll be powered by those wind turbines, and therefore they'll be clean. And that is a big bet, because we're not totally sure if there is the room in which we can do that, because to make all the clean stuff, to replace the dirty stuff, we're going to have to use a lot of carbon and other environmental inputs, uh, simply because it, it takes time to make all the stuff. That means that any stuff made with the clean stuff, all of that is going to take environmental inputs to make. And 
So many of these campaigners are saying, look, the biggest way that you can use your power and the biggest, most powerful thing in the world right now that's speeding us towards this uh, is the consumption model. And that has got to be changed, if not just to hedge our bets. Of course, we should be swapping what's already here and dirty for the clean. But shouldn't we also just be reducing the amount of things that we're doing anyway, if not just to hedge our bets? Mm, that makes a lot of sense. I was actually just going to ask, you know, about that, the mainstream kind of model of swapping dirty for clean, which you just spoke to and, and to take a kind of more concrete example. So of the coal mine in Cumbria that I mentioned at the top of the show, and you know, it's obviously had a lot of scrutiny and lots of environmental campaigners have been arguing for it to be cancelled and potentially replaced with renewable energy projects, just as you were laying out there, which they argue would provide clean jobs and tackle the climate crisis at the same time. And a lot of people we have on the pod, you know, advocate for renewables as a roadmap out of the crisis that we're in right now, you know, creating green jobs along the way. So in your opinion, then, is that something to be doing alongside the kind of more systemic work, as you just said, or could that push towards renewables itself be a problematic endeavor that we should be wary of? It's a great question. It depends what we're using all of that energy for fundamentally. I'll explain what I mean by that. We could be saying, okay, great, we're going to get all this renewable energy going to get all these green jobs, but they will still be in service to an economic system that almost demands the constant consumption of things that we're starting to see probably aren't so great for us. A good example to think of this is that there are sort of limits to how the amount of material things in society that are created are actually good for our well-being. Beyond a certain threshold, the argument that we just need to keep getting, for example, the latest iPhone isn't that credible, right? Instead, it's about reaching certain thresholds of material well-being and then what that enables us to do. So to use the iPhone as an example or a smartphone in general, I've got access to then all my mates because I message them through various things. I've got access to elements of social media and that kind of stuff. And that provides me with a level of connection that means I can have all this social activity that is just probably quite fantastic, notwithstanding all of the problems that we know exist with social media and that kind of stuff. But to just continue to be getting the newest iPhone every six months or one year is where we've got a serious problem. If we're making society cleaner, but we're still engaging in the creation of all of these things that fill our lives, that's a very risky strategy because A, it's doubtful there's a lot of empirical evidence around this, that all of the environmental costs that come with making these things, they cannot be disappeared. And then B, even if they could, is this what we want to be doing anyway? Don't we want to be focusing much more on the fundamentals that we know are really the things that make up our well-being, like being sociable, like having the basic comforts of enough nutrition and a roof over your head and a feeling of voice and like you are participating in a society. And I think fundamentally what a number of the people who are sort of questioning whether or not this strategy of swap dirty for clean, everything else is fine, guys, which is a crude characterization of the mainstream, but it's sort of somewhere in there. They're saying mm, that's a very risky strategy to bet the planet literally on this ability to continue our current model of consumption and in the parlance, decouple it from environmental impacts because we've left this very late and it's also questionable whether you can even do that at all with the current types of consumption and material growth that we have. Okay. I want to come back to a couple of points there um, at the end when we talk about some of the solutions, but for now, just to stay in it for a bit longer. So as we know, the debate over the climate crisis isn't about whether global heating is real anymore. Now we're talking about how we should be tackling it, which arguably is a big step forward. But now that we have arguably some sort of consensus, what are the different responses that are emerging in the field and the kind of different innovations that are being put forward as a way out of this? Let's think of this as sort of three levels. This may be useful. Um, it may not. The first level is to do this process of swapping the dirty for the clean effectively, right? And this is the kind of argument that's made by people like Bill Gates in his latest book. He talks about there being two main figures that you need to know. It's the 35 or so billion tons of, of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere each year. And then the other is zero, which is where I need to get to, right? And he lists off all the kind of technologies that we already have that would enable us to get there. And 
that's absolutely right. And those technologies, they do exist. We've been told that this is technically feasible and they need to be rolled out much quicker. The second level to think of is how do you achieve that goal? So how do you achieve the rollout of all this clean technology? And that's where you get into the realm of the types of policies that governments or companies or and particularly people in the financial sector are employing to make sure that all the money that's out there are being channeled in the right direction. Instead of going over here to invest in a coal power plant, they're going over here to invest in that clean technology. And there is a big debate, which uh, NEF, for example, is engaged in, around whether or not the policies that are being suggested at the moment are the ones that will actually lead to that first level of change, to this rollout of the cleaner stuff. And a big issue there is allowing governments to spend at the scale that is required. And this is a problem that we see in the UK here at the moment, that we get this positive rhetoric around acting on the climate crisis from the government. But then we get announcements of certain amounts of money, often in the low billions or maybe slightly more, toward those investments. And we've been told time and time again that that's just these are not of the scale. We're talking tens, hundreds of billions. You know, President Biden was talking about a two trillion or so plan in the in the US, and that's kind of at the scale that we need to be looking at. Though obviously, is a proportion of the size of the British economy. The third level is then to say, okay, well great, we're rolling out this clean technology. And we've also got the policies, like particularly the allowing the amount of money that government needs to spend to help with this process. But we still need to make sure that we're taking some measures around the consumption that we're making, right? The point I was making just now. And and here, this is where there are some uh, lots of very innovative ideas that I don't think are yet really anywhere near the kind of political imagination of what it means to tackle the environmental crisis. So these are things that basically try to provide different goals for the economy. Uh, So instead of this focus on on the growth of material things, often measured in terms of gross domestic product, instead, we should be looking at people's health and well-being as the primary goals of the economy. And then to do that, we need to provide people with the security in which they can do all the things that improve their well-being. Like, for example, providing a suite of basic services like healthcare, like we do already have here in the UK and education, but also maybe, you know, the right to certain quality of public space and the right to be able to move around places safely and cheaply and accessibly. So we can use that to encourage more what you could call public luxury, so that instead of being stuck in a situation where you're having to to work really hard all the time to get the money to sort of meet your basic needs, we open up more space in people's lives, we provide for more of those basic needs. So then people don't necessarily get stuck in this kind of a feedback loop in the moment where we're sort of working really hard and sort of satiating ourselves with certain material things instead of having the room we need to engage in the kind of things that fundamentally are what we should be doing to get the best out of life anyway, which are precisely those that would limit our impacts on the environment. Mm, I mean, it's clear that what we're talking about here are kind of huge systemic responses to huge systemic issues, right? Not tinkering at the edges. And I guess often when we have guests on the pod, it can feel similar, right? That we're mapping out this entire system, which is broken or, you know, is functioning as it's supposed to, but is um, destroying the planet or the people living on it. And then we're talking about the scale of the response that's required. And I think it's brilliant that organizations like NEF are doing the work that they're doing and books like this are being written that really kind of map out just how interconnected all those different pieces are and divert attention away from some of the other narratives. I think that uh, we see popping up, for example, a kind of more eco-nativist response or papers like the Daily Express, who are kind of former climate deniers running Green Britain environmental campaigns and things like that. But And then then the final thing, I guess, that often comes up is when people talk about climate change, they talk about it as a kind of dichotomy of either the world being saved or the world ending and there's nothing in between. And yeah, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on on those alternatives that emerge in response and whether there's a place for that kind of thinking and that kind of framing in what you're advancing. So your point about the dichotomy, the sort of thinking in terms of binaries, I think is really important and it's going to get more important, right? So we, in 2018, we had this huge moment where the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN science body, like the authority on the climate crisis, came out with this report around 1.5 degrees. And 
it was transformational. It's, it's almost hard now to think back to the kind of moment before that when it was just frustrating, still frustrating in a different way, but hugely frustrating that it, it didn't feel like the conversation expressed through the media, what politicians were saying, what campaigns were doing was really in touch with how serious this problem is. And that's been really transformational. One of the things that helped that happen was this frame adopted by the media, understandably, in a way, that we had 12 years to save the world, right? And that was used in headlines and stuff to try and pull together a simplistic narrative of what was quite a dense and in some ways complex report. This idea that we had at the time when it was released, 2018, 12 years until 2030, and at that point, we needed to have reduced emissions globally by about 45%. And it's totally understandable how off the back of that, that frame of 12 years left to save the world came about. And I think it has in many ways been very useful because that has helped underpin so many things. All the campaigners I listed earlier, you know, amazing politicians who've emerged subsequently, like Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in the US and frames like the Green New Deal. The problem is, is that this is not a situation of binaries. The climate and other natural systems that we have knocked out of their safe, normal, stable functioning are astonishingly complicated, more complicated than we can even sort of conceive of, though we're developing pretty sophisticated capabilities to understand how they should work and how they're not working at the moment. And this will all come to the fore a bit if, slash when, we breach this 1.5 degree target, which is one of the two along with two degrees. It's kind of the stretch target alongside two degrees that countries signed up to with the Paris Agreement in 2015. Because the world will not end, blow up or other Hollywood ending, on the 1st of January 2030 when the temperature reaches, if it does at that time, 1.5, no, 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 one degrees uh, above the pre-industrial average. Instead of thinking of this in sort of win-lose or kind of cliff edge terms of, you know, you're going along and then you fall off the end. We need to think of this much more as, as like a, imagine a smooth road in a particularly unwelcoming environment. And the way the world has been over the last 10,000 years has been like driving on that smooth road, very stable, very predictable. I mean, we built roads on glaciers and cities on permafrost. It's astonishing to think that now, but that's how stable it was. And there is a cliff edge at the end where we smash things up so much that we do fall off the edge and it is an absolute global catastrophe. And in an age of hyperbole, it's quite difficult to really get your head around what that means. But that basically means the conditions for any form of organized, stable society disappear basically across the world when we start to reach really high temperatures. So instead, we need to think of it as, sure, that's at the end. But before that, we've driven off, we've drifted off this smooth road onto this bumpy, alien, unforgiving topography, cars bouncing around, there's big lumps that you could fall down, there's all sorts of crazy things going on. And when we do, if when we do breach 1.5, we're going to have to wise up to the fact that that is the situation we've got ourselves into. And I think that among many, some of which you mentioned, there are certain types of of cultures that are starting to spring up in response to that growing realization. I think of it sometimes like a sort of saddleback, like sitting on a horse. You could slip off into one direction. On one side, you've got a kind of hysterical, pretty ignorant, I think, optimism. And I use hysterical on purpose there. Sort of, no, we can do this. We can win this. Technology will help us one more heave towards market perfection, the financial system will help us get all these kind of investments, and that kind of stuff. And it's understandable why people think this way. The other side, you could slip off the other side into what is increasingly a misanthropic fatalism that says, you know, either, oh, I've read a load of pretty wild blogs that say, the scientists are lying or understanding things and, and we're done. And there's going to be this big methane burp and everything's going to fall to pieces. Or they say, sure, it may be physically possible to do this, but politically it's not going to happen. And it's a disaster. And, you know, we may as well go and build communities off grid. And I can completely understand that kind of view as well, because this is overwhelming and scary. And as you were saying, the scale of change that we need is almost incomprehensible. 
But we're going to have to stay on the saddle pack in between those two cultures as things progress. Because to throw in another analogy here and to mix them all a little bit, it is like over the last number of decades, the narrative on the environment has been akin to you know, spotting a storm in the distance, being on a ship and saying, hey, guys, there is that storm in the distance. If we make small changes now, we will avoid it. Now, what happened over the last few decades is that we didn't. We kept on that bearing and the world accelerated into the storm. And now we're in that storm. And that materially changes the kind of uh, narratives we're using, the way that we need to organize ourselves, because we're not just going to have to do all the huge changes that we need to move out of the storm, but also we're going to have to deal with the consequences of the storm coming and batting us. You know, like there's a hole in the hull and people are very scared and they're getting sick and other people are, are trying to rip the lifeboat off and save themselves. You know, so we're going to have to deal with those two things simultaneously. And it's going to be very easy to slip either side of a particular binary of thinking within that context. Yeah, I think that's a really useful way of sketching it out. And what was coming to mind when you were talking then with the many wonderful metaphors was um, the abolitionist movement and kind of Afrofuturism more generally and how social movements in this moment have so much to learn from each other around what the future can look like and kind of really imagining into that. And so much of the amazing work that I've seen coming out of, say, the youth strikers has been to bring together those different strands. And like some of the most fantastic speeches I've seen at their rallies or online or whatever have been from young youth strikers talking about, you know, an abolitionist vision, for example, is one that imagines a kind of a world without prisons and also the path to get there that involves all of these different kind of huge social changes. And they're the kind of changes that we would also need to bring about if we wanted to, for example, speak to the climate crisis or deal with problems around kind of migration and the hostile environment or problems around precarious work or housing or anything. So again, it just kind of, there's also something very exciting in the prospect, even though it's terrifying of really kind of building a unified movement that has those different pieces and is able to kind of flex the muscle of political imagination in a way that's, that seems wholly necessary. We're going to wrap up soon, but I just wanted to quickly talk about COVID. We have to talk about COVID. COVID is the new Brexit on the NEF pod. It's kind of like, if we don't talk about it, then it's not a real podcast. And you've written COVID is a warning from the future. So could you talk a little bit more about that? And what does the way COVID has unfolded have to do with the climate crisis for you? I think there are are a number of things there. One warning from the future that we're talking about is what it's like to be in the storm, to use that final analogy. Um, for people who particularly, I'm not saying everyone, but particularly in government and policy in countries like the UK, it's sometimes been hard over what has been a period of unprecedented stability in many ways over the last few decades to remember that bad things can happen and they can happen really quick and they can overwhelm your often limited ability to respond. And that in many ways is what happened with with coronavirus. I think something came upon us very quick and showed up a lot of the lack of resiliency that we had in society in the UK. You know, it, it really brought to bear all of the things that so many people have been warning about over the preceding decade or even longer. Cuts to frontline services, the lack of a proper health strategy in this country that can deal with huge inequalities, particularly in people's your know, living conditions, which then led to disproportionate death rates among certain populations, you know, and so on. And yeah, COVID is both a warning from the future, a more destabilized future in which threats and crises are popping up all over the place and cannot be separated out as individual things. Coronavirus isn't just a health crisis, right? It became a crisis of public finances. It became a crisis politically, you know, the list goes on. And it's always been the case that you can't really separate out certain bits of society from impacting others in the way that, for example, governments are set up, like the transport department, that kind of stuff makes it seem like. But in a world in which the global environment is being fundamentally destabilized and that's getting worse, it's these types of overwhelming society-wide problems that we will increasingly see into the future. The other big thing is that it's also a warning from a far more unequal future and you think my goodness how can we be more unequal than we are now but yeah in a future where we are we're saying 
oh, well, 1.5 is out of reach and, you know, we'll just wait. The next goal is two. And I think there we risk it going higher and the next target being 2.25 or something like that. You are, as countries in the global south have been saying for a very long time, you're not just betting the planet and its overall stability on that. You're also chucking us all under the bus, you know, and that's already happened to some degree by the level of temperature rise already seen so far. There is no safe level of temperature rise. And that is a problem. We should care about that from a moral perspective, both in the present, because more and more horrendous impacts are spreading around the world. Also in relation to the past, because the reason why we're in this situation is because mainly, not all, but mainly Western nations who have contributed the most to the cumulative problem of environmental breakdown and reap the benefits and the impacts now falling on trees, particularly in Global South, that didn't contribute as much and are still suffering under the injustices of the last many hundred years. So we should care about it morally for all of those reasons, but we should also care about it from the perspective of being at a muster of cooperative global response to deal with this problem, again, in the same way that we see with coronavirus. And to put it bluntly, you simply, I do not think, will be able to muster the cooperation that's needed to deal with this unprecedented global problem in a high inequality world. High inequality equals low cooperation and all the inefficiencies that come from inequality as well. And in the same way that we should care about vaccine distribution in the global south from a moral perspective, from the perspective of wanting to make sure that people are healthy around the world and global equity, we should also care about it from the perspective of we're not going to be able to deal with coronavirus unless we are all working together to help us vaccinate people and to deal with the pandemic. And it's exactly the same thing when it comes to the environmental crisis. Yeah, I mean, there's clearly lots of parallels there. We've spoken a lot about on the pod so far about the solutions, some of what the solutions could look like. So it's what I want to end with as well. With COP coming up later this year, could you set out some kind of short, medium and long term ways forward? I know it's obviously a huge, uh, a huge ask, but um, yeah, just for our listeners to go away with potentially something really tangible around this. Of course. So in the shorter term, we've got to be making sure that We're not seeing this as, quote unquote, just a climate crisis. There's another big environmental summit this year. It's in China and it's on biodiversity. And we need to, in the short term, make sure that we are tying all of this together. I think it's starting to happen, but it's not fully happening. A a narrative around this being a sort of full spectrum assault on the natural world and a collapse in its ability to provide the support that we need. Into the medium term, and by that I would say over the course of this decade, We need to sort of evolve out of the status quo response to how we then deal with that situation. And by that, I mean that we need to go beyond the let's swap dirty for clean that we were talking about earlier and start to question what's at the very heart of our economic model, why we're doing what we're doing, what goals we want to succeed in, then the policies that we would use to get to those goals, like, for example, allowing enough investment to create lifestyles that mean that we can do the things that matter to us, which, hey, can also be done in a way that reduces destruction of the environment. And then into the longer term, the next couple of decades are crucial, we have been told, by the top scientists around the world for avoiding the very worst or catastrophe. You know, these words and phrases are often bandied around. And what that means is that we have got to go for bro to reduce our impact on the environment below a certain threshold to avoid these feedback loops, which are starting to appear. Like, for example, temperature goes up, melts some ice in the Arctic. There's less white surface in the Arctic, less ice to reflect back the sunlight. So then it gets warmer, which melts more ice, which means less reflective capacity, which, you know, and it goes on and on. There are other huge feedback loops in other natural systems And we are getting close, and we may even be stepping over the line here, of triggering them. And they are bigger than us. They could be out of control and could lead us down the road and off the edge of the cliff. And so the next couple of decades is about doing all the things that I just said to try and avoid those feedbacks kicking in. Into the longer term, it is a huge multi-generational, a vast multi-generational project to restabilize the natural world and to live more harmoniously within it and with ourselves. 
And that is a hugely scary, overwhelming prospect. But it is one, as you were saying, when it comes to the astonishing imagination that we see from school strikers and from movements around the world, particularly in the global south, for decades, if not hundreds of years, it is one full with amazing potential to not just dream of a better world, but to bring one into existence as well. I mean, let's get to work. <laughs> I, I really, I, I want to let you go, but I just had one final question, which is, I guess, with my lefty organizer campaigning hat on, um, I know that you said that it's not enough to have a vision. We need a strategy to get there. And, and, and that's obviously a big part of what you were just laying mm. out. And one of the fantastic framing and comms people we have on the pod often, Anat Shankar Asario from the States, her provocation is that we, I guess, as people of the left who are organizing on these things need to stop being so comfortable sitting in the resistance and kind of cultivate a desire for being at the helm. And I was just wondering if you had any final thoughts on how that might look and how that might apply to everything that we've been talking about. Are we as a movement really kind of ready to take leadership on this? Yeah, it's a huge, one of the most important... Just a quick final question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and and, yeah, and like the, the sort of question, right? Because a lot of the things that we've explored over the course of the pod are not new. There are things that have been known about for a very long time and things that people have been arguing for for a very long time. The big question is how we then organize to make sure that those things are one or or to further evolve our existing organization. I'll throw a few probably disjointed thoughts out there. One is that the, the arguments about how we need to make deeper, more fundamental change to our economies and societies have always been around, but they are It could be that the time for them is coming, at least the opportunity for them is coming more than ever, right? So I'll quote something directly from a United Nations report, one of the latest synthesis reports, which says that only a fundamental system-wide transformation across technological, economic, and social factors, including paradigms, goals, and values, can reverse the current trends that threaten the well-being of present and future generations and the survival of other species. Now, you could say, oh, yeah. What's the UN elements of the UN been saying this kind of stuff for years? And, and that, I think, it would to a certain extent be true. But the amount of people across society in positions of power otherwise who are cottoning on to the fact that we need deeper transformations was picking up, I think, before COVID and has increased during coronavirus. And people like, I mentioned her earlier, Alexandra Casa cortez who are very honest and open about making that argument in an explicit way and employing frames like the Green New Deal, which have kind of translated that into a politically sellable frame, I think are really leading the line in a way that is quite novel. And we've got to continue to push that. You know, Hopefully, we will look back in a few years' time and we will see her and the others around her as first movers for what became a a much bigger upswell of a kind of younger generation, progressive, systems change oriented politics that emerges. Alongside that, I also think that we need to be employing the sort of full picture of trying to win degrees of power, not just trying to win concessions, which anyone who's listening to podcasts, I'm sure, has always thought, oh, you know, that can't be the limits of our ambition. But that has not necessarily been at the heart of many of the strategies around the environmental crisis over the last few decades. It's been about winning concessions and not about changing the political weather and and trying to win power so that you you don't need to win concessions of someone. You're the one introducing that kind of stuff. And that means parliamentary stuff, like I was saying about, you know, in relation to politicians who move after Alexandria Cortez has moved. I also think it means entering a whole wider range of subject areas. Like, for example, in this time of COVID, as well as environmental problems, narratives around healthcare. And there's a huge, well developed nexus of thought and practice around the links between the environmental emergency and healthcare, which could be particularly salient at the moment. And I also think there's got to be more, and I think this is quite difficult for people in some of the communities that you mentioned to start to engage on issues like security. We had a UN Security Council meeting chaired by the UK 
at the end of February, which looked at the climate crisis as a, a security problem, as something that robs the world of of the basis for its shared security. And that is, I think, quite an uncomfortable frame to be used or, or to be engaged with among some of these communities. But there is a risk as time goes on that people suddenly realize, oh, my goodness, the environment has been trashed. The world is, is seemingly falling to pieces. All those people over there in the in the military uniforms, they clearly know what's going on. And we have got to be both accommodative, I think, of those perspectives to engage with them, while also making sure that there is a simultaneously complementary but antagonistic frame to them to make sure that we don't think of it in those terms. It's got to be thought about in terms of human rights. And we've got to be able to argue for changes to the economy beyond just them guaranteeing a quite narrow, often Western frame of security as well. So it's a the current moment, I think, is unprecedented. There's opportunity everywhere. We've got to understand how a lot of change has occurred even in the last two years and how we need to keep pushing on the directions that have been developed over the last few years and also opening up new fronts as well, including and in particular explicit elements about becoming people in positions of power and influence as well as seeking to influence them because a lot of people are scared and they're looking for answers. The curtain has been peeled back on a more chaotic and unsafe world for many people, particularly in this country, over the last year or so. And within that tragedy comes unprecedented opportunity for the kind of change that we would be seeking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Laurie. Unfortunately, that is uh, all we've got time for. I probably kept you longer than I should have anyway. No, <laughs> it was just really fascinating. Laurie Laybourne Langton, thank you so much. If people want to find out more about your work, where can they go? What should they read? Where can they grab the book? They can uh, pre-order the book at the moment on all good bookstores online and hopefully independent bookstores as well. You can also go on to the Verso website, our wonderful publishers, and pre-order on there. So learn more about that and some of my work. You can go on uh, laurielaybourne.com, my website. And I would also urge you to Google Matthew Lawrence as well, who's my co-author on the book, and learn a bit about his work at Commonwealth. Uh, which is the think tank that he founded, which looks particularly at issues of ownership around, uh, among other things, the environmental crisis as well. Fantastic. Yeah, Matthew is a good old friend of the pod. Um, so definitely encourage listeners to check out Commonwealth too. That is it for today's Weekly Economics podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, as always, please tell someone about it or you can drop us a line with your comments and questions. We're at Neff on Twitter. The Weekly Economics Podcast is brought to you by the New Economics Foundation. I'm Aisha Thomas-Smith. Stay safe.